Okay. I will be brief, I hope. Uh, so I wanted to thank the other organizers for obliging me to give a talk and present what I've been working on for the past year, off and on. Um, you'll see that it, uh, it might change your life, but it doesn't change any of your inputs or anything like this. And it also obliged me to do some benchmarking, which was quite useful. So to, to make sure that what, uh, what we're doing is, is actually useful, working. So this is the problem I came upon a few years ago. I started making uh, BFPT phonon calculations with Abinit, as always, but with much bigger systems. So this is an example uh, in a work with some experimentalists who do TEM, and they had uh, samples of graphene with some silicon atoms that are substituted in a lattice, and they can move them around, and they wanted to know what the phonons were, and so we went and did the 72 atom uh, phonons. Okay. It was doable. There aren't too many electrons in, in carbon. There was quite a bit of vacuum, but it, uh, it, it worked. It took some, some time. If you do this on big systems, you have many different issues with DFPT because you have to do each individual atom uh, perturbation separately. If you have little amounts of symmetry, then you end up with three and atom calculations. Each of these takes a lot of time. And really, the, the breaker was the amount of memory that I needed. So I ended up running on, on a small number of cores, but with a huge amount of memory per core. Okay. And then we started doing things with uh, Zeda and, and Pedro Melo, uh, like this one, um, looking at the optical properties of uh, 2D materials with uh, vacancies or substitutions and so on. Uh, this is just 74 atoms, but uh, Pedro was able to run uh, Espresso and then Yambo to do the electronic properties with GW and even beta sub beta on uh, this huge system. What we would like to do is combine the two and get some dynamics and some electron phonon coupling in, inside. But this implies that I need to be able to do my phonons efficiently. And just going from carbon up to molybdenum and sulfur, it multiplies the number of electrons by four or five, uh, two sulfurs instead of one carbon. I mean, it becomes a mess and, and that was really not feasible. So uh, quick reminder, um, when you want to solve the DFPT equations to get your phonons or your dielectric response and so on, uh, you always come back to the Sternheimer equation, which looks something like this, uh, in which you have ground state quantities in red. So you have all the ground state Hamiltonian and eigenvalues and your perturbed states. This is for perturbation alpha, say one atom moving along the X direction. Uh, the new perturbed state is in blue and the corresponding Hamiltonian, which is the potential of the whole thing when you displace the atom along the X direction, is the, this Hamiltonian H alpha. So the, the equation looks quite a bit more complicated than the, uh, the normal cone sham equations. And in particular, you use this projector function PC, which projects out the occupied subspace. And this is done in order to guarantee that your perturbed state has a well-defined uh, gauge. And this, this projector PC is still, still ground state quantity, so it just depends on the different uh, occupied states, psi j, and you can write it as one minus the sum over all the occupied states or just the sum over the perpendicular orthogonal subspace. Okay. Um, this is actually paradoxically a simpler equation numerically to solve than, than for the ground state because the orthonormalization is, is a bit simpler. The, the orthonormalization of a state psi i is with respect to the ground state wave functions and not with respect to the other perturbed wave functions, which is an, an order n3 operation, whereas this is, this is reducible to like order n2. And so it's, it's a little bit easier. And this, this, this is a, not a self-consistent quantity anymore. It's something we already calculated. So the self-consistency is limited to these blue things and uh, H0, uh, Psi0 and so on are, are constants. There are a bunch of other expressions which were the, the biggest headache in this whole uh, is scheme for calculating a whole column of the, of the dynamical matrix. Once you have one perturbed state for atom one along direction X, you can get all of the cross uh, perturbations for two, per, uh, two, two displacements of atom one, atom two, X, Y and so on from this kind of operation, where you just have this, uh, this psi alpha we just calculated in blue and the corresponding density, um, and then the ground state wave functions in reds. And what you have to evaluate for the other perturbation is a uh, potential. So this is not self-consistent, uh, something mixed here if you have both and, and so on. So all the green and, and uh, turquoise quantities we have analytically 
inside the codes. Um, in PAW, I, I spare you all the expressions, but it's, uh, it's much more horrible because there are many, many more terms, but the idea is, is exactly the same. So um, these equations are, are trivially parallel with respect to K. I've put some more indices in here. The Hamiltonians and the states depend on the, the K point that you're looking at, uh, but they're also parallel with respect to the state that you're perturbing. And this, this state number I here is, uh, is the same on both sides of the equation. In PAW, it's more of a mess because you have an overlap matrix, but still, um, it's, uh, it's still state number I here on left and right. Um, that would make me happy, except that you have other operations hidden inside these PKs, um, PCKs, which depend on all the occupied states. And so I, I'm not actually really doing a diagonal operation on state I. I also depend on all the other states J. The final degree of, of parallelization could go in the FFT grid. If we wanted to parallelize all the G vectors, all these scalar products that we do with the different operations could be parallelized over G vectors, but there's a lot more communication because you have to pass the plane waves around all over the place. And so that's uh, even in the ground state, that's not always very, very interesting. So this has been implemented, both the K point and the band parallelization for at least 10 or 15 years. Um, but because of this uh, projection operation, you have to keep all the ground state bands on each processor. And that means you have not one, but you have three wave functions for each band. The ground state wave function, if you have a finite Q vector, you have the ground state wave function for K plus Q, and you have the perturbed wave function uh, CG1, which is just the coefficients of this thing. And so your memory really explodes. You have, you have three wave functions times spinners, bands, plane waves, K points, those you can distribute, that's fine. And, and so these, these two quantities in bold really make your, uh, your memory explode quickly. And it's, it explodes differently depending on the system you look at. It can explode simply because the cell is big. Here I have 72 atoms, but that's by far not the biggest system Abedent has been run on. Um, but I have a large amount of vacuum in the C direction. So that costs a lot in number of plane waves. Um, but if you run a big system like this one with uh, some several hundred atoms, uh, then your number of bands is going to be very, very large. The number of electrons per titanium atom here is, is huge. And even if the, the volume is not so big, you're still going to be paying a, a lot for the bands um, or bo both if you have a big system in both directions. So what can we do? We can use OpenMP to just accept the fact that we have huge wave functions on each node, but then we use all the cores on a given node and all the RAM to operate on uh, the loops simultaneously without duplicating memory. This is, uh, this is okay, but um, it's actually very easy to do, but it's limited by the amount of RAM that you have on a given node in your supercomputer. So it's not super flexible. And the, the, the amount of, no, uh, of RAM per core is, is not not really increasing over the past years. We could distribute the FFT grid, but as I mentioned, this is uh, this has limited scaling. Uh, we can distribute the band memory. I thought this was the simplest operation, but it, it turned out to take me over a year. Uh, so that's what I'm going to talk, talk to you about uh, next. Or we could potentially do both. We could do the analog of the parallel KGB uh, and and distribute both the bands or the FFT grid depending on the different stages of the calculation inside your self-consistent cycle. This implies having a transposition, uh, which is quite complex, but uh, okay, that, that may be for the future. So I went up and did it and went through all the different routines, uh, limiting the number of bands which are stored on uh, each processor depending on how many processors I give the, the algorithm. Um, and uh, this, uh, this new number of bands is called m band underscore mem to mirror mk mem, which is the number of k points per uh, node. This is the number of bands that are stored per node. And so this goes through the whole chain uh, from the, the loop over perturbations down to the self-consistent cycle, the update of the density, the update of the wave function, and finally the CGWF which is really the core uh, operation of applying the Hamiltonian onto the, the, the wave functions. There are also, and these were the worst because there are many, many different subcases for PW in particular, um, many expressions for the non-stationary uh, cases, which also operate with the same uh, op objects. Basically, you still have the psi one, the psi zeros, and you have to, you have to play around with them. 
the one constraint we have now, which was not the case before, is that the number of processors uh, divided by the number of K points has to have a rectangular distribution with the, the number of bands. And so this, uh, the, the, the band parallelization is now a sub communicator of the K points. And say you have uh, 15 cores and three K points, then these three colors are the different K points. I'm gonna give the first five core, uh, cores to K point one, next five to K point two, next five to K point three. And within this, I have chosen cleverly 10 bands, which is a multiple of five. And so I can put two bands here, two bands here, two bands here, two bands here, and I'm happy. Um, if I had six, so if I had 18 cores instead of 15, I would be stuck and uh, at least three of the cores would not be usable because my 10 bands would not distribute over six. And so I, I, I'd be stuck. Um, this is not a, a technical problem right now. It doesn't stop the calculation, um, but uh, now these, these processors will simply not be used. So it's a waste. Uh, one important painful fact, which few people realize because it's, uh, it's not explicitly shown in the output files, the number of K points will change for each perturbation, even for a given Q point, depending which direction you perturb the atoms, you're going to get a different number of irreducible K points. And so potentially this is, this is quite complex and you'd have to go and do one perturbation at a time to really optimize things. The, the, the resulting distribution is tolerant to that. So you, you can just run it, but it, it might not be supremely efficient. Right. So the one operation which is uh, a pain in this, this whole distribution is the projection where I need all the bands for the ground state and I need to project them onto operators or onto the, the perturbed wave functions. So here I have the distribution of all my bands across all the K points and, uh, and processors. If I look at the bands which are on my, my first set of, of processors, so in the first pool of bands, um, Processor one has bands one and two, three and four, five and six. So each one of these is going to be dealing with one perturbed wave function at a time. But I'm doing actually five perturbed wave functions at the same time. And on this core, I have perturbed wave functions one and two. I also have ground state wave functions one and two. On this one, I have perturbed wave functions three and four. I have ground state wave functions three and four. And so I'm gonna to have to communicate between the two uh, and, and between all the, the bands in the pool. So what I've done is set this up in, in, with an additional loop and it, uh, it checks which bands are active right now, which bands are being treated by one of the processors. And then it, uh, it communicates the information, the, the quantity that's being projected is sent to everybody in the pool. Everybody projects against their own ground state wave functions because these are local to, to core one, these are local to core two, these are local to core three. I can do all this uh here operate this on my my new wave function i obtain a, a temporary variable on each core and then i just uh squash all these cores together and i obtain this uh psi uh star, this psi uh bar what i've done is is count this one minus occupied subspace uh on each core and uh, this is fine the sum of this will give you the total sum over all occupied states but the sum of the ones will give you the number of cores in, in the, the band processor uh, pool. And, and so that you have to remove, once you've squashed the, 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 the psi bar, you have to remove this, this bit of the original vector that you, were, that you were saving. If this belongs to core one, it saves it. If this belongs to core two, it saves it and so on. And then you can go back and, and continue your, your application. You don't really need to know this because it's, it all runs uh, smoothly now, but inside, this means that I'm doing a lot more communications. I have to broadcast the Psi-1 to everybody, and I have to do this reduction, which I didn't have to do before because I had all my, all my ground state bands on, on each core. So this week, I stressed uh, Joao quite a bit, and he very kindly uh, did a lot of tests on a system that he's, he's running right now, which is lithium fluoride. Uh, it's a very small system, but he artificially inflated it. So it's just got two atoms, but he has one K point, took one displacement of the lithium long X, but then he cranked up the bands to a thousand just to be able to see the parallelization. And depending on the, the machine that you run on, so we've, we've run on Mare Nostrum and on NIC5, which is a machine in, in Liege, the wall time uh, on, on recent machines seems to keep going down even for 
a distribution of uh, up to 100 cores for the bands. That means there's just 10 bands on each on each core that are left. The memory for the, for the wave functions goes down as as expected. It should. And the total memory goes down decently, but this is a bit hard to estimate. So this is the best. This purple thing is the best we have on uh, on Mare Nostrum. It looks like in the end you have additional temporary arrays, which uh, which which cost you a little bit uh, if you distribute uh, too much. Bottom of the story: um, there is an efficiency limit in how much you can distribute your bands because you're paying for communications, uh, and it will depend on the physical system you're looking at, whether you have lots of K points, lots of bands, big system, small system, lots of plane waves, and it'll depend on the hardware and software you run on. But indicatively, based on my huge sampling of five or six systems, it looks like you can go up to at least 10 bands per processor without paying too much. And <clears throat> yesterday, one of my calculations finally on a, a much bigger system finally converged. And so this is a, a vacancy of sulfur in a, a molybdenum sulfur, sulfide uh, layer, six by six monolayer uh, unit cells in the plane. Sorry, one minute. Yep. Yeah, I'm done. And I just wanted to show you the screenshot because this is what Abinet thinks it needs, 36 gigabytes per core. And this is what it's actually using, 2.3 gigabytes per core. Um, but it's not quite done yet because there are some additional arrays which are still quite big because they depend on the number of plane waves. And so that's the next uh, frontier. Uh, I'm going to have to look at how to parallelize the different quantities like densities and potentials and, and other things like the, the 3D plane wave phases, um, which still depend on the size of the, of the FFT uh, mesh. So these are just 128 uh, megabytes, that's fine. But there's a huge object which is doing to the mixing for the Poulet algorithm. It saves many, many copies of the potentials or of the densities, and this is still weighing over a gigabyte. On, uh, on this system. So, and it's only 75 or 100 atoms or something like that. So, um, for the future, we could go to full uh, parallel KGB. Um, this would be a limited uh, speed up, but it would be a further reduction of the memory. Or we can go for the OpenMP generalization. That's my personal favorite. And in passing, if you do 2D systems with lots of vacuum and uh, use the GGA, we found very recently that there are uh, some problems with the convergence of some phonons. And so this, this calculation I'm, I'm, I've shown you on the previous slide only works in, in LDA. It works to brilliant precision. We got the potential down to like 10 to the minus 9 in a massive unit cell. But with GGA, the potential just explodes in the vacuum. So something is still wrong there. OK, thanks a lot. Thank you very much. So we have a comment from Mark, who really would like to thank you again for reluctantly <laughs> agreeing to you to give this presentation. And then we um, have a comment from Massimiliano, who didn't know that parallel KGB didn't work, and uh, says that there should be some comment about it. Otherwise, he has been fooled for the last five years. So it works fine for the ground state, right? But in the it's in the DFP. It, it just ignores anything you tell it for the parallelization. Abidin, Abidin knows best, and uh, you can put anything you want in the input file. It does what it what it wants to. Yeah, but the code doesn't tell you. <laughs> as I, yeah, yeah, <laughs> no, it's, about what it's, it does, uh, it's even problem. how many K points it uses. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, now it should be telling you how many K points it actually has per perturbation and how many bands it has per uh, processor. So this is an improvement, but you're right. There, there, there are additional checks that have to be made. Mm -hmm. if, if an input variable is present, there should at least be a warning to say, I, I'm ignoring you, hello. Yeah, okay, thanks. <laughs>